We're going to start tonight uh, by going to 1 Peter chapter 2. And this is the epistle of Peter written to a uh, group of um, that was in Babylon and in Asia Minor. I mean, it was directed to that region. And um, Peter um, starts on chapter 2 here. It says, uh, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile, and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So I want to start with this section of verses first here. Um, laying aside, on verse first, on, on the first verse it says, uh, wherefore laying aside. So, this speaks uh, about action, laying aside. Um, this is an action that is um, empowered or is uh, pushed by a fear that is in us, a fear of the Lord. And um, if you see, it doesn't say, like, wherefore living to the Lord that he removes the malice and guile, hypocrisy, envies, and never living speakers. It says laying aside all malice. So it requires that we are the ones that have to make those decisions before we allow any of these things to be manifested in us. So this is very hard because it's like when you think about the the enemy and we can uh, the Lord gives us the ability to fight against the enemy, but at the same time sometimes there are things that we need to deal with our own flesh. And probably those are the most challenging ones, um, dealing with our the flesh and our sinful nature. So on verse, um, on, on Proverbs fourteen 16, I'm just going to uh, read it here. It says, A wise man feareth and departeth from evil, but the fool rageth and is confident. So, one of the mistakes that sometimes we could make is that uh, to think that we are strong enough to stand or to have dominion upon our own flesh and um, to act like if we um, have already conquered certain areas, we have to be watchful um, every time because these things could be manifested even if we think that we have already uh, defeated them in our lives. And... Um, we have another example in the Bible, which is everybody knows about Joseph when he was at Potiphar's house. And um, what he did when, when, when the temptation came, he didn't, um, he, it doesn't say that he bowed down and started praying that an angel will come to save him. No, it says that he ran away, ran away from Potiphar's um, wife when she was trying to seduce him. So it's the same Concept when Peter says here laying aside is um, that action that we need to take before we allow our mouths or our desires to be manifested um, with malice, guile, hypocrisies, envies, and all evil speakings. We see on the verse 2 that it says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, the ye may grow thereby. So some of us may think, well, I'm not a baby anymore. I'm not a spiritual baby. I've been in in um, in Christianity. I've been a believer for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. I don't know. And um, but in under this um, uh, the concept here is that as newborn babes is like a regeneration of our minds because we're supposed to be regenerating our minds, um, desiring the sincere milk of the word, meaning that by the reading of the word, studying of the Bible, we keep regenerating our mind, and that makes us even more hunger of that source that is going to feed our 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 minds. Um, it says that ye may grow thereby. So. 
this when it says desire the sincere milk of the word in another translation actually in the spanish translation but also in other translations in english it says un, un adulterated milk on adulterated milk so what is the adulterated milk is something that is not pure something that when the milkman maybe has added water with sugar i don't know something to make it more abundant And it's funny because I think of when I was a uh, when I was a kid with my brother and my mom. Um, she didn't like us to drink Coke or Pepsi or I don't know pop. And um, what she would do is that she would adulterate the pop. <laughs> she will add water to the pop, <laughs> and we will think that we were drinking pop. So. Yeah, it's not the same. Definitely it's not the same as the real stuff. So it's the same here. We have to be um, um, develop that hunger for the word, for the pure milk, so that we can be fed. That milk, that um, food that is not contaminated with, you know, with other doctrines, other stuff. I was listening to a preacher saying that we all know that we some of us can be Baptist, some of us can be Protestant, some of us Pentecostals, etc. But we all know that there are some other churches out there that are not r really Christian. Like um, they're not even falling in a category of different doctrines or different uh, beliefs, but it's some churches out there these days that where they're doing some stuff that is not something that is please please uh, pleasant to the Lord that he approves um and this is becoming more and more normal too so i was telling this to when i was listening to some um music that i put i thought it was like a It was like a moment of worship, and I thought that they were doing a good job. It was this lady with another guy, and they were just playing the instruments and ministering and letting the Lord to flow. And I, I felt that everything was going okay, and I was just uh, enjoying of it. And it was like 25 minutes after listening to them, then this guy starts... Uh, singing with a tone of a song that we all know that is not <laughs> Christian, and he had just changed the lyrics. I was like, "Wait, like that sounds that doesn't sound good. That's like not even trying to cover it. Like it's, he just changed the lyrics, and he was just in the middle of such a precious moment." And it was like, that is not right. That So some things that some people, yeah. So we have to be careful with that, that we are desiring that sincere, pure milk of the word. Um, there is on verse uh, three, we know that we have tasted the goodness of the Lord. In the King James Version, it says, If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Now, in other versions, it says, If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Um, other translation says, Since you have tasted that the Lord is good. And how many here have tasted His goodness, His grace? Over and over again, He has delivered us in different occasions from evil, from... Um, Uh, from death, he has been our provider in multiple occasions. We have been witness of his goodness to us. So it is important that we remember that that we, those who have tasted the goodness of the Lord, is very difficult for them to justify certain actions. Um, there was. Um, warning in the Bible about not being like the children of Israel in the desert that were complaining about the manna. And they were receiving that goodness of the Lord day after day. But after some time, they started to not appreciate that. So there's that warning also that we must uh, be cautious about. 
Now, I wanted to continue reading here. Actually, this is um, uh, a very. These are there are some good uh, thoughts here that I enjoyed studying on verse four of First Peter two. It says, we're going to read to, uh, I'm sorry, we're going to read verse 4 and verse 5. It says, To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, yea, also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up, offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Now, we are familiar with uh, living waters, that concept in Christianity, but we don't typically refer uh, as stones as being living living stones. We know about the cornerstone, that is Jesus Christ, who he is the foundation. Um, but it's very interesting how Peter, the Apostle Peter, brings this concept of us, the believers, being l- as lively stones. I was thinking like how a lively stone, like maybe to my mind it comes only when we make it lively or appealing when uh, we paint it or unless it's a precious stone. But the concept here is different because he continues talking about the spiritual house and um, living stones denotes motion. It the it speaks about action also. I can think of the river stones or even the stones in the ocean. Um, the, with the river stones, there is a phrase in Spanish. I don't know if there is a phrase in English for that, but when the river makes sound, that means that it's bringing stones with it. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. It rhymes in Spanish, but I don't know in English if that's the same idea. But if you hear that the river that is being loud, is coming down and is being loud, that means that it's bringing stones with it. And it's true. Like, you think about it and then you see these stones that are shaped in a very smooth way, that they're constantly being tried with that movement. So that is the only idea that I could think about the living stones. And I also wanted to show some pictures of... Um, this is a beach in El Salvador. Oh, the, the, the other one, the, the one with the stones. Where, so I put that as a reference because that is a very remarkable place in El Salvador. It's called Beach, uh, it's, it's called Beach El Tunco, which means the um, pig or the pork. <laughs> Some people say that, yeah, that, that has the shape of a, of, um, uh, what is it? A pig? Yes. And if you th- if you see, it's like a pig, but just with the nose, and then the uh, mouth, and then like the legs. <laughs> so yeah, then it, it's hard because I used to think that it was just the big one that looked like a pig, but then I realized that it's like a pig smiling with the legs. So that's. Um, hot tourist spot in El Salvador. Now, this beach is known because it has beautiful waves. There have been, they have hosted uh, world championships for surfing championships before. But the only thing is that during certain times, it's full with these stones. And um, it's interesting because when you think about these stones, usually it's at uh, you see them at the lake, maybe smaller, or you see them uh, in the rivers. But if you can show the other picture too, no, the the other one with the stones, please, <laughs> that one. So sometimes you get to the beach and it's full of stones, and you're like, oh, okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get into the water today because <laughs> it's not comfortable. You're hitting your thing, your feet, and all that. It's amazing how the water in the ocean brings up all of these stones. And there are some massive stones too. They're huge, some of them. And then during certain times, and this could be like from one day to the other, it can change. Now you can show the other. (laughs) Please, thank you, Becky. 
and um, the beach can be very clean as that. So this is in the same area. This is the same beach. And if you show the the other one, um, that one is the same. I was looking for one that had exact exactly the same spot, but but with the sand only. But I could only find this one. And you see how the water, the waves. I mean, is doing something with these living stones. Is bringing them out and taking taking them back. So I think about. Maybe because Peter, I don't know, I'm just, this is only an assumption, but he knew what he was talking about when, because he was a fisherman. Maybe he had seen this, uh, in his mind, these stones when he was writing this um, verse. So with these lively stones, and then I was thinking, our house where Liz and I live is a very old house. And the basement, when you go down to the basement, it has like the first level of the foundation. There are stones, but they're smooth and they're like put together in a way where they fit together. It's very nice. Um, and um, you don't see like rough, very rough stones. Maybe you, you can see those, but uh, the ones at least that we have in our basement are like those smooth, big stones. And this is what I'm thinking when the apostle is saying, are built up a spiritual house. Um, yea, also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house. So, um, when he's talking about the stones being used as material, um, he's speaking about the believer, I believe. <laughs> Necessary we are all necessary to build that house. And um, something interesting I found in First Kings 6, 7. This is when the Temple of Solomon was being built. And it was interesting that it says, And the house, when it was in building, was built of stone, made ready before it was brought thither, so that there was neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was in building. So it's an interesting concept because while we are in during this life in earth, we're being processed, we're being chiseled, we're in the quarrel, which is the world, the word, world. And um, we're being prepared so that when is the time when the Lord prepares his house and is preparing that house, but we're being shaped in a certain way we're going to put in that place. And remember, in eternity, um, I mean, whatever we have learned and we have been trained in this during this time in, in earth, there are some things that we're not going to be able to be trained on there during that time in eternity. So we are being shaped right now during this time um, then we have the concept also of the building which is um, uh, we are becoming a spiritual sacrifice also by being part of that temple now I wanted to keep reading on and, and um, we're gonna go we're gonna go to first Peter 2 verse 6 it says wherefore also it is contained in the scripture behold i lay in zion a chief cornerstone elect precious and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded unto you therefore which believe he is precious but unto them which be disobedient the stone which the builders disallowed the same is made the head of the corner and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. So I, I think I have heard here from pastors saying that uh, when for a law-abiding citizen, the laws are not an offense. But if you're, if you're not, um, you know, abiding by the law, then the law really becomes an offense to you. It becomes a 
punishment also to you. But if you obey the law, that's not a punishment. It's a, also, it's a protection. So, speaking of uh, the applications during on, on these three verses here, one of the applications that I uh, wanted to touch a little bit here is the foundation concept. When it says... Um, that he is the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone. He is the foundation. Jesus Christ is the foundation. And like Matthew 7.25, it says, um, And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon the rock. So we want to be like that wise man, this building that structure upon that rock. So that the winds of these times, that all the um, things that are affecting us um, on a way where things that are good are being called bad and wrong, and what's wrong is being called good. And this time is when we need to found our build, building, our construction upon the rock. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So there's no question here that um, if we are are, uh, building our house, our convictions, our uh, basing our walk on Him, uh, we are in good hands. We are going to remain. So, in Ephesians 2.20, is just as a reference, but it says Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. Uh, it says, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now, there's another application, and we are almost done here, but... Um, is thinking about the stones as a weapon against the enemies. And I was thinking about David when he picked up the five stones from the river. Um, we can find that story in First Samuel 17, verse 40. And I can think of David being so small, uh, getting ready to fight against this massive person or giant that uh, is unbelievable that his the courage that the lord uh, had placed in his heart to fight against goliath and i can think of him like going to the to the river and just choosing these stones trying to find which one will be better which one will be a better bullet and maybe somebody asking what are you doing oh i'm just Picking, selecting the stones that are gonna, with the ones that I'm gonna use to defeat the, the giant. So that's uh, something I like to think about those things because it's something that is unbelievable what the Lord can do with uh, uh, with something so little, so insignificant. So First um, Samuel seventeen forty it says and. He took his staff and his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag which he had, even in a scrip, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So, now, why five stones? Many of us know that Goliath had other brothers. So, we, um, David was doing it in faith, like, this is going to be for Goliath and these other ones for his brothers, siblings. So that's a way to think. He was really a, 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 someone who had a vision. So there is one more application before we finish. This is really a short message, but it was just, we just wanted to share these thoughts. And there's this last application. Um, rem- is the spiritual uh, is thinking about the stones being used to rebuild the house or rebuild the walls, and if we can go to Nehemiah 
chapter 4, verse 1. It says, um, starting, we're going to read Nehemiah 4, 1, 2, and 3. But it came to pass, then when Sembalat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews, will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the head, heaps of the rubbish which are burned? I know this sounds very familiar with those attacks that sometimes the enemy starts shooting at us in our minds. Like, if we're so little here, are we? Is God really gonna move? Is the revival that we're expecting is that really gonna happen in my age? <laughs> is that so? It sounds very familiar, like doubt, trying to. There's mockery, there's doubt, there is, um, you know, like something that really can mess with your mind if you pay attention to those words. Now, on verse 3, it says, Now Tobiah the Ammonite, Ammonite was by him, and he said, Even that which, that which they build, so the other one was saying that they were not going to be able to build it. Now this one is, make it, maybe there is a chance, but even if they... If that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. So this is even putting more doubt about, okay, maybe what if they are able to build this wall, but even if they do that, a fox will go up and will break it down. So pure mockery, pure attacks. So in the spiritual application, I believe, I really believe that this is how the enemy um, starts attacking our minds. Uh, that's why we need to regenerate our minds. Now, verse 11, it says, And our adversary said, They shall not know. We're still in Nehemiah 4, 11. And they shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them, and slay them, and cause the work to cease. Now, this is a threat. Like this is almost like a. Uh, this is a attack that takes a step up of what they were doing. They were mocking. They were putting doubt. But this one, here on this thought of this attack um, of the mind, is putting on them like the possibility of being attacked and being murdered, basically by their adversaries. Adversaries. Um. Now, I like what verse 17 says here. Nehemiah 4.17. It says, They which builded on the wall, and they that bear burdens, with those that laid it, everyone with one of his hands wrought in the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. So, if you think about the spiritual application these days, this is probably how we have to build the wall during these times when it's so difficult. Because, yes, we want to continue building for his kingdom. We want to be good, faithful servants that are putting their best effort to produce fruit in the kingdom. But at the same time, we have to keep that balance of being ready with a weapon, with our, um, which the main weapon would be the, the sword, um, to counterattack any attacks that come from the enemies, from the adversaries. So it's not in a sense of going out for, to look for a fight. It's in a sense of having that balance of being producing, being building in this group, in this small group, even if it's small in the fellowship, if we're building, but at the same time being ready, have a regenerated mind that is um, thirsting for that pure milk so that we are ready to fight with our other hand having a sword. So we want to be called good, faithful servants when we get there, and we want to be shaped according to the position where God is going to put us when we get there in that uh, 
spiritual construction. So this was the message that I wanted to share tonight. And um, yeah, I think that the Lord spoke to me in different ways. And I hope that the Lord spoke to your hearts too. God bless you.